You're listening to the Infinite Banking Mastery Podcast. Did you know that you could build a tax-free pool of wealth that's liquid and accessible all your life while building your retirement nest egg? Gain full control of your financial future and stop relying on the government and banks. The wealthy have already discovered this wealth building secret. Now it's your turn to get financially secure without following the conventional wisdom that keeps you in debt to banks. Now here's your host, Valerie LaRoque. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Infinite Banking Mastery Podcast. This week, we're going to go back and talk about the problem again, which is where I started last week. I started that section last week and didn't get very far. I got about as far as the Bible verse on the very top of the very of that page. I'm telling you, every time I read Nelson Nash's book, which I do read every so often, but still I would say is not often enough, I always get a deeper understanding of Nelson's words and his wisdom. There's always something else in there that you can kind of um, absorb and gather and learn from as you read it. So if you have that book, I would definitely encourage you to read it again and read it every so often. It will remind you of what you're doing or will remind you the foundational concepts of this strategy and you will feel empowered again to move forward and be excited about what you're doing. So in this section that um, again is called the problem, Nelson gives an example of what he calls an average all-American person. The reason he states that he's building his scenario around, quote, an all-American family is because he wants people to know that you don't have to be rich to create a banking system that can handle all of your financing needs. In his book, he wanted to give an example of an average American making just an average wage, not some astronomical amount of income, and show that a person can still do this with a smaller income. His example is of a 29 year old male making 28,500 a year, which of course this book was written a while ago, over 20 years ago. And so back then that was probably more of an average and maybe some parts of the country, it's not that far off in Washington. It certainly is very, very low, but that was his example in the book, 28,500. So there is a chart that he's going over on this page, and I actually have gone over this chart before as well in a previous podcast about two years ago, but I figured it'd be a good refresher to go over it again and maybe point out some different things from the text. In this chart, he's sharing what this 29-year-old man does with his after-tax income. So Nelson has paid attention to and studied the habits of American families and has discovered that the average American is spending about 20% of his after-tax income on transportation and about 30% on housing and then another 45% on living expenses, such as groceries, vacations, car insurance, clothes, contributions to religious and charitable causes, and other miscellaneous things. And most Americans are actually saving less than 5%. But he decides in this scenario that he is going to give this a man, this average American, the benefit of the doubt and say that he's actually saving 10%. So he's going to lower his um, living expense costs from 45% of his after-tax income to 40% of his after-tax income. And one thing I want to point out as well is that he is saying that many of the living expenses that are being purchased are being financed by credit cards and that the balance is being financed by paying cash for them and and thus giving up interest that they could have earned. And there's that statement again, because he says you finance everything you buy. It's one of my favorite statements that he says, because again, you are either paying interest and financing something that you're purchasing through a bank, through another route or a loan from some other place or a credit card, or you are giving up the opportunity to earn interest on your cash. If you're paying in cash, you're giving up the opportunity to earn interest on that. You're choosing to give that money over, pay in cash for something rather than leave it in, say, a whole life policy and allow it to continue 
earning interest while you are borrowing against it to do something with it. So he's saying you are giving up the opportunity to earn that interest. Therefore, you are financing everything you buy. Okay, so back to the chart. He says that if you add up all the interest that this person in this example is paying, then he is paying roughly 5% in interest on the car payment. About 25% is going away towards interest for his mortgage payment. And another 5% is going away on living expenses for credit cards or other types of loans, maybe a boat loan, a motorcycle loan. And I just want to point out again, because I did before when I talked about this topic, that when he's talking about losing 25% in interest on a mortgage payment, he's referencing the fact that most people, or not maybe not most, but a lot of people will buy a house and live in it for, say, five to 10 years and then want to move. And the worst period of time that you're paying interest on a house is those first five years, five to 10 years, where the majority of your payment is interest. So you are paying so much interest in those few years and then moving and then starting up that on that same time period again, where the majority of your payment is going towards interest. So that's why he's saying 25% of the 30% you're spending on a mortgage is going away towards interest. But the total interest going out from these three categories is about 35%. So he's paying roughly 35 cents of every dollar spent in interest. So if this young man was to simply stop the bleeding and stop paying out all that interest to other banks, he would already be ahead before he invested in anything. So people become so focused on the rate of return for different investments, but are ignoring the fact that we are willingly handing away roughly 35% in interest. So if we just stop doing that, we're already ahead by 35% forget the rate of return, we're already doing much better. And then we're able to basically be saving 45% towards our future rather than the 10% because we're no longer bleeding out all that interest. And of course, once we've got that going, we've stopped the bleeding, we have our banking system running, rocking and rolling, then yes, we can absolutely look for rate of return in different investments and borrow against our policy and go out and find that rate of return somewhere else, not inside of your whole life policy, your Whole life policy is an asset, not an investment, and it's going to do by far much more for you than any savings account. It's going to be a great place to house your savings dollars where the banks are not going to be multiplying out and, and fractional reserve banking and causing more of an inflation issue in the country. And from there, and of course, there's all the other benefits, accessing the funds, the growth tax-free, the guaranteed growth. But from there, once you have that system built up and, and you're, you've locked in the earning power of those dollars, then you borrow against them, go out there and seek that rate of return that you might be seeking in a different investment. You can utilize your banking system to create other cash flowing opportunities. Nelson then goes on to give an example of how much we are paying in interest when we finance something, for example, a car. In his example, this person is financing $10,550 for a car at 8.5% interest for 48 months. But he points out that almost all cars that are traded for a new one are not fully paid for when they trade them in. This would mean that if the car was traded at the end of a 30-month time period, that means 21% of every payment dollar would have been for interest, would have gone towards interest. And even if the person keeps the car the full 48 months, still about 20% of every payment dollar went towards interest, would have gone towards interest. What he's trying to point out is that we're focusing on the interest rate, the 8.5%, but what's way more important than the interest rate is the volume of interest that we are paying how much interest we are paying in total. He goes on to give an example of a mortgage to redirect our attention to the volume of interest being paid on a, a house in total, rather than just keeping our attention on the interest rate we are being charged. You know, people are always throwing around, oh, I have 3.5, oh, my interest rate was 4, 4.5. That's always the focus is what's the interest rate and how low can I get it? But people aren't really focusing or paying attention to the volume of interest that they are paying out in total. And it's especially bad if you don't stay in the house very long, like I mentioned earlier. So in his example, he uses a five-year time period before the person would move to a new house. 
In that case, with a 7% interest rate on a 30-year mortgage, with his mortgage, this mortgage was about 93000 pretty low mortgage, about 86% of every dollar paid out is going to the bank for the cost of financing. It's going to the bank for interest. It's just totally nuts how much of your payment, how much in volume that you are paying. And then you decide, I don't like this house. I'm going to go get another house. And then it begins again. Same big, huge chunk of money going to interest first. And that's just why it's just so important to build your own pool of cash, to start being able to finance your needs through and start capturing the earning power of your dollars rather than just let these dollars slip through your fingers and then therefore building the wallets of the bank owners. Well, I hope that this section of the book shed some more light on the banking concept for you. I hope that you'll tune in again next week and that you'll reach out if you are ready, you're feeling ready to start your own banking system and you would like to work with me. I would love to meet you. You can reach me at Valerie at alphaomegawealth.com. Thank you very much for listening. I hope that you have a great week. Take care. This is the podcastfactory.com.